We trust the lamb, not the donkey or the elephant. I want to get into a framework that you develop in the book, but before getting there, you talk about an article in The Atlantic by George Packer that's called The Four Americas. And you said this has had a a big impact on how you think about the modern day political religions. And and the four Americas he talks about are smart America, free America, just America, and real America, which means nothing to anyone listening. So let's talk through each one of those. Let's start with smart America. Can you describe for us what smart America is according to, to George Packer? Yes. So I say when we think of smart America, we think of, you know, Silicon Valley, science, technology, institutions, belief in progress and kind of the sense that, man, we can use these things to to change and transform the world. Uh, When we think of free America, I think of things like uh, the suburbs, the free market, like hard work, personal responsibility, ownership. Uh, Like the Wall Street Journal America. Yes, exactly. Totally. And when you think of just America, you know, think of like the urban core and members of different identity groups who either inflict or suffer oppression and the need to dismantle unjust systems and establish more just patterns in our our social life. And then we think of real America, you know, uh, you think of things like uh, the Midwest, more rural areas, a sense of loyalty to deep roots, um, protection from outside threats and uh, often maybe places that have been left behind by some of the coastal economic booms and all, you know, and, um, and I remember reading that article and after it became an influential book, uh, reading that article and going, oh man, I think he stole that from Jim. And my, my co-pastor, so Jim and I co-pastored together for years and, and Jim was brilliant with this stuff. And as he and I were processing through these things leading into the last election season, you want know, to, uh, I'm joking, of course. I don't think Jim Packer has, George Packer is listening to <laughs> Jim's sermons, you know. Uh, but what struck me was uh, Jim's been talking about something very similar, though using some different language to describe it. Uh, but part of that is going, I think what Packer's saying and what Jim, what Jim would say is, you know, that um, we tend to think still in kind of this left right spectrum. And yet yeah. there's something more complex that's happening today where left and right doesn't seem to do justice to the complexity. So Packer's language is there's these four Americas, kind of the smart, free, just, and real America uh, that's more complex than just left and right. Um, and I'm sure we'll get that in a minute, but but Jim and I began using some uh, different language, but similar categories to try and map the landscape, if you will, of where we're at today. Yeah. Yeah, so, so so let's talk about some of those categories. And I have to say, I mean, what I find really helpful about what George Packer did is our, our contemporary kind of globalized media environment not only uh, tends to treat America at times as a whole, which is ridiculous. If you have a friend in a different part of a country, you will quickly understand how different their life is, their context is, the kinds of people that they're around. Um, but like you just said, it, it also complexifies the political picture to realize that you, you're right. We can't talk about the left. We, we might have to talk about this center left kind of technocratic Sam Altman, you know, Bill Gates, uh, you know, Elon Musk. Technology can lead us to the future. Jeff Bezos. But that's a very different kind of left than maybe you know what he calls just America, which is more of your you know Robin D'Angelo, Ibram Kendi, radical queer theory. Like, hey, we we need to we need to overturn the system. It's like those are both left. Left, but why, they don't even like each other. <laughs> yeah, and <laughs> sometimes really the biggest the with each other. Totally, and sometimes the biggest conflicts today seem not even between right and left, but between different camps within yeah. the right and the left. Seems to be where some of the biggest heat can be generated. Well, yeah, because you see the same thing on the right with, again, the more kind of classic center right, uh, conservative, you know, we believe in capitalism, we believe in the free market, Wall Street Journal, and the combat that's happening between them and, uh, you know, the more nationalist type movements that are more populist in orientation. They're like, well, the free market isn't working out. Businesses have been co-opted by, uh, you know, woke organizations. And uh, we need to, you know, basically redefine our political life together to prefer people, you know, more like us who live in this kind of existence. So again, you see those exact same battles and you see media organizations falling across them. What I appreciate about the book is that that's very sociological. Like we're talking about uh, kind of how different groups of people are thinking. Uh, but you guys take that and and, and Josh, you've, you've, you've developed on top of that maybe a theological way of thinking about it. So I, I want to go in a little more depth here and talk through each of those um, four political religion. So we're going to take those four social categories and talk about them theologically. I want to talk about each of those. But let's start with uh, the political re- religion of smart America. So this is the more, you know, technocratic, you know, Silicon Valley, we can, you know, everybody can live forever if we can just cure aging. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, and, and you call this the religion of progress. So tell us more about that religion. What is the religion of progress? 
Yes. So uh, maybe first off, too, just a caveat here is it, it, in this, I'm not I'm just trying to be descriptive here. So at this point, I'm not trying to like critique them or we're just trying to map what is the landscape? Because I think for so many of us, we're going to what the heck just happened like over the last decade or so. It just feels like things feel very different now. And I think many people are having a hard time mapping like where are we and how do we get here? What's happening? So where I find my friend Jim's language really helpful is where George Packer gives us like a sociological landscape kind of Jim's gives us uh, some the values that are underneath oh, yeah. a lot of these, these, these quadrants, what we call the four quadrants, the four political religions, and it can help us kind of evaluate them theologically, as you mentioned. So uh, the first one, so if you think, if you, for those who are listening, if you think in your head, you know, you got like a right left spectrum, but if you can also add in the middle, like a top down spectrum, and uh, we're going to talk about that as like modernity on top and post-modernity at the bottom that splits and kind of makes a, um, four quadrants, right? Mm -hmm. And so in your upper left quadrant or modernity on the left, we're going to call that the religion of progress. And this is, uh, as you mentioned, it kind of overlaps with what Packer called smart America. And so here, uh, the creed of this quadrant uh, would say is uh, we can change the world. Right. There's this optimism about science, technology, institutions, and there's this faith that we have in scientific discovery and technological advancement and higher education and research and all and going, man, we can change the world if we leverage these things in the right way. And so you could think of, again, like Silicon Valley, Google, Facebook, Steve Jobs, Bill Gates, uh, the smartphone technology, the tech boom, artificial intelligence, things of this nature, uh, as you mentioned, curing aging, you know, um, and I think the high priest in this quadrant, if we want to start looking at who are the you know, mediators of transcendence here, you know, uh, be people like Bill Gates or the Clintons or Steve Jobs, who's rallying, they're rallying the faithful towards this vision of progress, founding institutions that can help us get there. Uh, we think of uh, the worship leader of the squadron, I would think is like Bono, you know, uh, he's singing <laughs> hymns to unite and uplift humanity around, you know, changing the world. Uh, apologists in this quadrant would be people like Steven Pinker and Sam Harris, who are talking about, man, just the amazing uh, advancement that reason and modernity and all have brought uh, advancing the world and kind of defending the ascendancy of this modern vision through science and reason. Uh, sacred texts in this quadrant would be things like CNN, the New York Times, NPR, uh, the more, if you're of the more radical fundamentalist variety, like, like Mother Jones here or something, right? And yeah. uh, the sermons here would be like TED Talks. Um, TED Talks are their scripture uh, or academic research. Uh, that's where the authority is found. Uh, the temple in this quadrant, I would say, is the university, uh, particularly the STEM department, like science, technology, engineering, mathematics. This is where you can... Uh, gain a degree that allows you to ascend the priestly class in this and mediate the transcendence of progress to the world. Um, and I think of the zealous laity here, you can find waiting eight hours in line at the Apple store for the latest <laughs> iPhone, you know, which is almost like the iconic relic of this quadrant, which gives you access to omniscience, being able to know everything that's happened in the world. It gives you omnipresence, the ability to be present to friends and people around the world, even strangers, and uh, to omnipotence, the sense of the power of the universe in the palm of your hand, you know? And so all that to say, there is a, uh, trying to describe here, this quadrant is like a religion of progress in sort of smart America that has this value of progress, this creed that we can change the world, and this devotion that it cultivates in adherence. Yeah. Yeah. It's fascinating because I, I was thinking about how, you know, earlier you were talking about how we used to have God above us and God before us. And the God before us in this political religion is very much so we can have the best future for all humanity if we just follow science and reason and create a technological solution to every problem that that's that that's the ultimate promise that you're you're living for you're trusting in you're hoping for that you don't want to see counteracted uh, your, your second uh quadrant uh, we talk about the political religion of free america so again people remember this is the worldview of the suburbs emphasizes free market hard work dedicated to caring for you know whatever small patch of the world you're working on contributing to a thriving commodity um you take that that group and you call it the religion of responsibility so let's let's get into that what's the religion of responsibility Great. Okay. So again, here, so we're upper right quadrants. So this is modernity and uh, on the right. And here, the religion of responsibility, the creed would be 
pull yourself up by your bootstraps. There's a sense of faith in personal potential, in hard work, in good moral values, in responsibility, again, in the free market, business entrepreneurship, individual liberty. Uh, so we can think here, again, of like the suburbs and Wall Street. Uh, I'd say the high priest of this uh, was historically maybe Ronald Reagan, you know, um, who said man is not free unless government is limited. Uh, we could think of Milton Friedman, who kind of gave the economic uh, framework for this. It's economic apologist for this quadrant. Uh, Newt Gingrich is kind of its public herald, if you will. Uh, but that was kind of when I was growing up. I'd say today that uh, the baton has been passed to figures like Jordan Peterson, you know, who, uh, if you want to change the world, start by making your bed. So this emphasis on individual responsibility. Or people like uh, Ben Shapiro, uh, who, you know, exhorting his congregation of the, the faithful masses here. I think of people like um, seeing the rise of folks like Jocko Willink and David Goggin, who are mm. uh, leading the laity and kind of extreme ownership and the power of just taking responsibility for yourself. And and um, I think of Mike Rowe, the guy on Dirty Jobs, who, you know, he's modeling hard work and the sanctification through hard work and personal uh, responsibility. I'd say the sacred texts of this quadrant would be things like Fox News, the Wall Street Journal, the Daily Wire. Uh, its scripture is the stock market that's updated regularly for hourly <laughs> hourly observance of the faithful. Um, you've got doctrines. You know, if you want to go deeper with kind of doctrinal instruction, you could go to National Review or the Federalist. Uh, and thought leaders here have their annual denominational gathering at the CPAC Assembly. Yeah. And if the temple for progress was the university, I'd say the temple for this quadrant is the uh, you know, kind of the home with the two car garage, the white picket fence. This is like the reward for the faithful where they can uh, receive kind of that just recompense for their hard contrib yeah. work contribution to society and to live out family values and all. Um, and so big picture here, we're talking about this modern right, uh, this emphasis on responsibility, the sort of the core value that's driving this and this creed of you can pull yourself up by your bootstraps. Yeah. Yeah. Again, it's, it's interesting is when, when I think about that, the, the Jesus above and Jesus before, you know, as you're talking, this seems like a, the, the, the forward facing mission, what, what will change the world, what will make the world better is a very meritocratic, meritocratic vision. Like, Hey, if, if people just take responsibility, they'll merit getting good things and they'll live better lives. And if you don't take responsibility, well, that's on you and you'll deal with the consequences. But it's also interesting because what, what you've done here is you've also melded it with a kind of consumerism. Because the the quote unquote good life is like you said the the house in the suburbs with the white picket fence it's it's very uh, materialistic in its heart like I I just want to live a, a simple life with with my family and you know I want to have nice cars and and good things as a result of my you know hard hard work and so again I I, just, I think it's fascinating because it, this really does describe a certain subset of people and probably a lot of people inside of churches I mean I'm sure you can find each of these quadrants in churches but I have to guess that in a lot of evangelical churches if they're tempted towards one particular political religion, this might be the most tempting of the bunch. Uh, but let, let's go on. Uh, we, we've been talking about the two uh, modern political religions. Let's talk about the postmodern ones. But, but before we do that, could, could you just for, for people who are maybe getting lost in terms, what's what do you mean by modern and postmodern? Great. Definitely. Yeah, because both of the two I just described progress, responsibility, that felt like kind of what I remember growing up in, and, you know, as, as a kid, seeing those two just, just felt normal. But uh, the, you know, the, so the top down access, modernity to postmodernity. Uh, now, if you're a philosophy major, you're probably going to want to slap me right now for how simplistic I'm going to be, right? But just to make it simple, you know, we're talking about the top quadrants, modernity, uh, there's yeah. an optimism about uh, science, technology, institutions, things like that, kind of on, on both the right and the left. And uh, so the visual stereotype uh, that my friend Jim used here, I thought was, was, you know, think of like a scientist in a lab coat with a microscope and uh, that image representing things like the enlightenment and reason, scientific method. Uh, this is how we're going to solve the world's problems is through these kind of things. But when we start to make the shift down to postmodernity, I think we can think of postmodernity as a reactionary movement that saw a lot of modernity's failures, saw things like world wars and nuclear weapons, saw evil things like eugenics that were done in the name of science and progress, and has become what the lower quadrants have in common is a deep suspicion of institutions, of uh, technology, of, of authority, of, the, of those kind of things, of um, even of 
of science and reason, there's a deeper suspicion of those. And so the visual stereotype we might use here is that of an artist who's painting a picture of the artist, of themselves. Right, where there's a sense of an emphasis on creative self expression. Of, um, you know, if modernity was about discovering and defining the world, postmodernity is about constructing and creating one's own world. Uh, hmm. Yeah, yeah. That, that's really helpful. And I'll, I'll make this observation maybe again later. But what I find fascinating is in those two kind of modern religions of progress and responsibility. Um, those two groups are really gelling right now. Um, you, you can find people who, again, 15 years ago would have been on the opposite sides of the culture war. Um, they're, they're now making common cause, you know, so you can read a book by, you know, like a Yasha Monk or a Barry Weiss or, you know, people are probably more of the progress uh, quadrant of things. Um, and they're very much so making common cause with the Jordan Petersons and the Ben Shapiro's who are maybe more on the responsibility side. I mean, they, they would disagree. Yes. They have substantive disagreements, but their unity over hope about the future, there is hope for institutions, we can build a better world, seems to be more important than the left-right divide that would have divided them in, in the past. So let's let's get into some of these postmodern well, – uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, well, if I, if I can piggyback on that real quick. Yeah, because one question I wrestled with was like, you know, where does like the – what used to be called maybe like the IDW, the intellectual dark web kind of fit in. You know, some of the figures you're mentioning kind of fall in that. Um, which quadrant are they in? And uh, what struck me was like, I think they're actually um, like kind of the, the, the what they ha share in common is that modern access, you know? And there's almost like, so you see a lot of thinkers now and figures now advocating for uh, liberalism, kind of classic liberalism, which is sort of the high modern. And so there's kind of this common cause being made from, like you mentioned, a uh, Stephen Pinker and a Sam Harris with, a, you know, Jordan Peterson and a ben Shapiro and a Barry Weiss. And a, I think of Joe Rogan, you mean, I, I'm going to, I want to listen to all the voices and hear, you know, like there's this belief in um, if we have enough free thought and rational discussion and all, we can get to the truth. And so I, I think you're right that there's common increasingly as the, as the lower postmodern axis gains momentum, you see a lot of common cause being made with people who would not have spent a lot of time talking to each other and all back in the day, uh, up in kind of the upper modern axis. Yeah, yeah it's really fascinating. Left. And I think yeah. when we get down to some of these, you know, postmodern ones, that feels less the case when we get to these postmodern religions. They, they don't seem to be making common cause with each other, <laughs> with each yeah. other uh, which is fascinating. But let's talk through each of those. So, um, again, we earlier talked about uh, just America. So that's the worldview kind of inside of our, our, our urban core emphasizes the idea that uh, citizens are really members of identity groups that inflict or suffer uh, oppression uh, to one another. And the, the real kind of hope is a call to dismantle unjust systems and and, you know, rewire the system as it exists. Uh, but you call that social group, Just America, you, you call them a the religion of identity, which I think is really helpful. So maybe describe for us, what's the religion of identity? Right. So the religion of identity, now this is lower postmodern left, right? I'd say the creed here would be live your truth. Like don't anyone else, don't let anyone else tell you how to live your life, right? And so we can think here, again, like the urban core, figures like Ta-Nehisi Coates or Elliot Page, San Francisco and Boston. Think of race and gender yard signs, placards, you know, that are all around my city here. Uh, protests against a legacy of injustice, um, TikTok, Instagram mm -hmm. posts with an ethos of self-expression. And here, because it's postmodern, it's more pessimistic than the upper quadrants, right? And so more pessimistic about the ideas and institutions of modernity. Uh, there's still, I think, a desire for progress in this quadrant. Uh, but because there's this distrust of some of the external on it, that now the locus for progress is internal, right? Like we need to uh, free people up to be able to discover and express their most authentic desires. Um, it's not completely relativistic because there's still a big moral push for uh, we need to dismantle anything that gets in the way of that personal self-expression. And here I'd say the preachers of this quadrant would be people like pop icons, it's really like Lady Gaga or Little Nas X, right, who are modeling this way of salvation through continual kind of reinvention of themselves and performative self-expression. Uh, I think of prophets in this quadrant, people like uh, political leaders, like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, right, proclaiming sort of the good news of the gospel that um, 
will get to freedom through deconstructing and dismantling all the institutional roadblocks to, you know, that might keep people from being their authentic selves. I think of big tent evangelists, like you mentioned earlier, like Ibram Kendi uh, or Jazz Jennings, right? Um, where a lot of the greatest conversion growth in this quarter, I'd say, is happening on the forefront of the race and gender revolutions. You know, those are important conversations, not specifically just trying to map the lay of the land here. Uh, and the temple, you know, if the temple in the upper quadrants was like the university and the house of the white picket fence, so the temple in the lower left quadrant would be the protest, right? Where this is where uh, the voice of the people is expressed, you know, is able to express disillusion with the establishment um, and demanding change. Uh, sacred texts in this quadrant would be things like TikTok, Instagram. Uh, here's a place where, in, you know, influencers can provide you with a menu of options for how you could reinvent yourself. Uh, the catechism in this quadrant, I would say uh, things like the Disney script, right, where youngsters are brought up learning that family, tradition, authority are obstacles to discovering and becoming your truest self to letting it go. And, you know, I am Moana, like shouting to the world who who you really are. And mm -hmm. I love Disney movies. And again, like this is just trying to map the lay of the land in terms of where, um, where some cultural momentum is at. Uh, I'd, I'd suggest even like the high emphasis on things like personality tests, right? Like, today, like in, in a lot of my circles, dude, I've never gotten more hate mail than when I say anything less than enthusiastically positive about the Enneagram. <laughs> and I'm fine with the Enneagram, this is just on that. But like, even I'd say the hyper focus on, I need to understand myself and look within and know my temperament, my personality, my type, or strengths finder, whatever, whatever test, like just the emphasis as a whole on personality test speaks to kind of a, who am I and how do I best fit into the world, kind of that identity value uh and maybe one uh final thing here is you know i think in this lower part you mentioned earlier how maybe the upper uh right can be materialistic you know and i'd say well the upper right and left can be kind of a materialism of stuff i'm going to acquire the technology or the nice house or whatever kind of things and i'd say the lower quadrants uh including here on the lower left I found we tend to think that we're less materialistic or less consumeristic. You know, this is like, we're minimalists, right? Like was my wife and I, we're minimalists, we're not consumerists. But I think reality is like, it's just a new form of consumerism. It's like, we're into consuming experiences rather than stuff, you know? And dude, that's convicting for me. Like I found, oh my gosh, Holly and I used to say like, dude, we don't, we're, we're not into stuff, we're into experiences thinking that made us less consumeristic. But now I'd say, dude, it's all about like the craft coffee and the microbrew and the great vacations, often amazing locations and going to the music festivals and what, it, but we're about the experiences that um, I think is related to this quest or pursuit of identity and who am I and how can I experience the most of life to build that up? And so it's, you know, your, whatever your, your value or whatever, you know, that sign of status is no longer like the logo jacket or your handbag it's the location of your latest social media posts you know and so but all that to say this lower left quadrant now there's increasing momentum in this shift to things like the religion of identity which is really about living your truth yeah yeah i, I and i, I want to highlight that because you, you said earlier you know the main goal is to dismantle unjust structures which prevent people from living out their authentic identity and that's a very different goal in front of you than the progress goal, which is, you know, let's have humans live as long as we can. Let's end nuclear war. That's a much more institutional, large picture vision. Um, this is a much more individualized. No, I, I need to have freedom to live my authentic self. And even as you're talking about the consumerism, I mean, the thing that immediately comes to mind for me with this group is, is actually kind of the whole self-care industry. You know, you think about Gwyneth Paltrow and Goop and selling people, you know, tinctures and, uh, you know, uh, face masks and rubs. I, I don't know what, what all those are. Don't buy any of this stuff, uh, but yes, the you idea is, <laughs> I've seen your perfect complexion. I know you do. Seen your perfect complexion. <laughs> uh, no, but I, I, I think I, I, it goes into the experience element. But it's also saying that if I can buy products that 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 maximize my ability to be me and take care of me and express 
express me. Those are the kinds of things that I value far more than, like you said, the white picket fence and the suburban home and, and whatever else. And what's fascinating to me is we get into this next group, uh, kind of the postmodern right. They're actually very similar. Like if you go to some of these postmodern right uh, uh, events, they're selling their own tinctures. They're selling their own, you know, special sauces and, and, and rubs and face masks and their own thing. And they talk about toxicity as much as everybody else does because they're skeptical of, you know, toxins in their, you know, uh, their their makeup or whatever. It's just fascinating to me that there's this overlap that they both have this emphasis on kind of anti-toxic self-care products. <laughs> and it, and it, it's, but it's really a postmodern thing on both the left and the right. Uh, but let, let's move more to the postmodern right, um, what you called real America. So, you know, the worldview of the heartland rural areas uh, where there's a, a deeper emphasis. Well, it's kind of the anti-Disney script, like you said, on, on being loyal to your roots and the need to protect yourself from outside threats and to emphasize, you know, tradition and the past. But y you talk about the religion of real America as being the religion of security. So, so let's walk through that. Yes. Well, really quickly on what you last said a second ago, too, I think there's something to the, the religious nature of that, like that both the postmodern left and right, this episode on like, you know, purity and antitoxins, there is this kind of emphasis on purity, which is sort of a religious impulse in a way, right? Oh. Where if the upper right was like, let's purify kind of our institutions and the world from disease and purify kind of like moral responsibility and all these things that have this more institutional big picture focus. It seems like now lower right and lower left, the emphasis on purity is more like the, the self, like, like, like to keep yourself pure or free from the toxins of the corruption that that, that surrounds you in, in the problem. And it's fascinating that that themes like purity and boundaries and sacrifice to get there and all, you know, like our religious impulses by nature. Yeah. 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 Well, and it, so if we go to the lower right here, uh, what uh, Jim and I call the religion of security, right? So the religion of security, the creed here is good fences make good neighbors. Right, good fences make good neighbors. And here, this is, this is man. We live in a dangerous world. We need boundaries and borders to keep people safe. Uh, security it allows people to prosper. Uh, and so, to know that you're secure, you need uh, shared codes of conduct for insiders or rules of behavior. When this is how we live together. Right? And so, I think when we think here, like with Packers categories again, yeah, this is the heartland, uh, often left behind by the coastal economic booms. You think of things like Sarah Palin, Tucker Carlson, an emphasis on hometown identity. Uh, we think of things like Detroit and jobs shipped overseas. We think of like places like the Appalachian academic epidemic of unemployment and uh, addiction and all. And here in the lower right, uh, it's postmodern, which means that it's also pessimistic, like lower left to institutions of modernity. And so you think about things here where it's like, dude, the messaging here is like, dude, the deep state government wants to take away your rights. Like big pharma medicine is pushing its pills and its vaccines. Uh, the mm -hmm. fake news mainstream media is out to deceive you. The elites are out to get you. You need to be on guard and protect yourself against those things. Uh, I think the high priest of this quadrant is uh, Donald Trump, right? When we think of his most viral campaign slogans, they embody kind of these values that we've been talking about in the religion of security. And so if you think of, for example, like uh, build the wall, right? Like that spoke to uh, an emphasis on security in the context of borders and immigration or his uh, slogan, drain the swamp, right? Like that spoke to a deep suspicion of elites and institution, right? Or we think of make America great again, even uh, spoke to a patriotic nationalism in the face of globalization speaks to. And each of those, what all those slogans have in common is kind of a loyalty to us first, right? And which I think resonates, especially for those who have, it resonates for those who have experienced or perceived like a loss of jobs, a loss of safety, a loss of cultural cohesion. And going, man, we need to shore up, it can be the sense, we need to shore up and rebuild the sense of security. So I think of preachers and prophets in this quadrant being folks like Sean Hannity, uh, stoking the zeal of the faithful, uh, I think of figures like Roseanne Barr or James Woods who are raising the alarm on like the people who want to take away your rights. Uh, I think of Dana White, the head of the UFC, like the ultimate fighting championship, who uh, like many here will claim, hey, I'm, I'm not political, will claim they're apolitical, uh, but are constantly kind of the messages, dude, everything you love is under threat and you need to stand on guard against those things. The sacred text in this quadrant um, would also be like Fox, some other angles of Fox News, uh, Newsmax, Truth Social, Breitbart. Um, 
the more extreme fundamentalist end can be found in places like Ape Coon and some places that have can be conspiracy theory and stuff there. Uh, but one thing I find really fascinating as well is like we tend to think as in the Midwest and Northland, but I also think we see these values at play in like 90s hip hop culture. <laughs> I don't know, you would be, I think, a similar generation kind of growing up, you know, and I, and I think of not just the heartland, but in places where we think of things like gangs, often there's a sense of like, man, the streets are dangerous, the police are out to get you, society doesn't understand you, and so we need to stick together, our mm -hmm. safety's at stake. And what I think that shows that this isn't just like a, a, a thing, uh, this is a human uh, impulse, you know, this value is very, very human in nature. We need to stick together. Our safety is at stake. Uh, there's a high emphasis on loyalty in gang culture, like not to a sacred code that's kind of out there, but loyalty to insiders, those of us who are in here, who are on the inside. You have patriotic signs of identity, like gang colors, tattoos that mark one as an insider. Uh, the cardinal sin in gang culture would be like being a narc or a snitch or a traitor, which is like betraying one's crew, which I think we also see similar themes at play in some of the national lower right uh, conversation. And um, anyways, I think security helps explain why nationalism is strongest in this quadrant, you know, because it's seen as an antithesis or an antidote to globalization, you know, that there's often a sense this quadrant, like our integration into the global economy, it's benefiting elites, it's hurting the working poor, we need to rise up and kind of reassert our voices as the people of this, uh, this nation. Um, and if the, that can be the, the messaging, at least. And if the temple on the lower left is the protest, it's the temple on the lower right is the nation itself, right? Like uh, the nation is the uh, realm where there are heretics here who need to be shamed and called back to the ancient paths who are uh, running the temple, right? These corrupt leaders who are overthrown for, you know, we need to overthrow them because they're defiling the sanctuary in Washington, D.C. And the sense of man, there's hostile invaders at the temple gates, like um, needing to have a stronger enforcement of uh, kind of the sacred borders of the nation and all, which I think helps explain why immigration is such a focal issue for this quadrant, you know, because uh, there's broad agreement, I think, across the political spectrum that immigration reform is desperately needed. Uh, but here there's it, it's i think it taps into the value in this quadrant on security and the need for uh, security in the face of uh, yeah in the face of change but here again the religion of security uh with the creed of good fences make good neighbors and one of the things that we talk about in the book too is that all four of these values are good you know like we see in Genesis, in the Garden of Eden, we see progress, we see responsibility, we see um, identity, we see security. I mean, we'll talk more about that if we want, but all these things are good. I think there's values in each of these quadrants that quadrants that are good and have a proper place, biblically speaking. But the danger is when they become ultimate. <clears throat> to use our language earlier, when they become like an idol or idolatry, they can become distorted and lead to um, a devotion that is dangerous. Yeah. 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 You know, I, I appreciate what you do with this last group in, in the book in part. I think you do this with, with all the groups. I, I have to imagine if someone is completely committed to one of these uh, political religions, they're not going to like anything you say, because there, there is a critique there. Um, but I, I also found your descriptions humanizing, uh, and in particular for this bottom right quadrant, because they are uh, kind of univocally hated by everybody else. <laughs> and they, they, they receive probably the poorest treatment inside of media. And by highlighting security as the concern, you're saying, look, there, there, there's something that is good here. It shouldn't be ultimate. There's something that's good here that we need to care about, you know, and, and I think it explains, you don't have this in the book because you probably wrote the book too long ago, but you know, when you have people like Oliver Anthony and his song, Richmond, North of Richmond, that is this ethos. And, and it's a sense of we've been left behind uh, by the economic centers on the coast. Uh, elites don't care about us. Media writes terrible stories about us. And we're living hard, miserable lives characterized by addiction and poverty. And that's not the way it should be. This is my nation, and it should be different here for me. And, and again, 
I have, I have, I have critiques of that, but when I realize that's a human who is hurting and that's the case with all of these people that, that, that just creates a different orientation. So maybe let's, let's go down the route that you were just going down a second ago to say, Hey, what's, what's, what's good in, in all of these, when we're talking about progress, responsibility, identity, and security, what, what, what can Christians affirm? I'm Patrick. Thanks for watching this video. If you're passionate about ending tribalism in the church and giving Jesus your allegiance, you're not alone. We have a podcast and a book. They're both called Truth Over Tribe. You can download the podcast on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. You can buy the book on Amazon. I hope you'll check them out.